I know you're out there. I know that you're afraid. You're afraid of us. You're afraid of change. I don't know the future. I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. I came here to tell you how it's going to begin. I'm going to hang up this phone, and then I'm going to show these people what you don't want them to see. A world without rules and controls, without borders or boundaries. A world where anything is possible. Where we go from there is a choice I leave to you. The Chris Ann Hall Show. Any varmint that crosses that lady's path has met its match. Come on! Rise and shine, liberty-loving patriots. Welcome to the Chris Ann Hall Show. Liberty over security, principle over party, truth over your favorite personality. And that has gained us a brand new nickname. Congratulations, constitutionalists. The establishment has a new name for us. They are calling us the cult of principles. (laughs) Seriously. What does that say about them? How shocking is it that many in the GOP think that stinking to prin- sticking to principles is bad for America? <laughs> so much for the party of the Constitution. Perhaps it's because we believe that we need candidates who are morally fit, which means we are going to require our candidates to be morally fit. Because you see, if we don't get candidates that are morally fit, based upon principles, then we are forever doomed to pick the lesser of two evils when we go to the voting booth. Samuel Adams made the connection between the necessity for a moral people to have moral representatives. In a letter to James Warren on November 4, 1775, Adams said, There are virtues and vices which are properly called political. Corruption, dishonesty to one's country, luxury, and extravagance tend to the ruin of states. The opposite virtues tend to their establishment. But there is a connection between vices as well as virtues, and one opens the door for the entrance of another. Therefore, wise and able politicians will guard against other vices and be attentive to promote every virtue. He who is void of virtuous attachments in private life or very soon will be void of all regard for his country. There is seldom an instance of a man guilty in betraying his country who had not before lost the feeling of moral obligations in his private connections. Simply put, a person's private life must match his public life, and his actions must support his rhetoric. We need to stop listening to sound bites and campaign speeches and take a look at real records. Is this man or woman a person of integrity? Have they kept their word? Does their voting record reflect who they are now? Or are they reinventing themselves to get elected? Does their personal life reflect who they are now? Or are they reinventing themselves to get elected? I'm astounded at the people we've elected who claim to be true conservatives or who are Tea Party darlings. And yet every single time the Constitution has been on the chopping block, they have voted the wrong way. They bark and bluster about spending. They wrap themselves in the flag and pay homage to the military. Yet, on the one thing that makes America what it is, liberty they seem to be as ignorant as a day-old infant while claiming the claim with fire in their belly to be conservative they vote to gut the fourth fifth and sixth amendments in ndaa 2012 they vote to make your right to assemble a federal crime in hr 347 
They continually support the expansion of federal police powers in the name of fighting terrorism and have no problem diminishing constitutionally protected rights to do it. And when challenged, it always boils down to one argument. It's necessary. We had to do this because, and then, you know, fill in the blank. But William Pitt the Younger said in 1783, Necessity is the plea for every infringement of human freedom. It is the argument of tyrants, and it is the creed of slaves. Perhaps that's why the establishment believes that you have to uh, be a member of, the, of a cult to stick to your principles. Maybe that's why they want to call us names and demonize us, because sticking to principles seems to be somehow contrary to establishment Republican votes, and they don't want you to have principles. They don't want you to go to the ballot box and require morality in their candidates, because, you see, the establishment power is maintained by forcing people, or at least making them believe they are forced, to always pick the lesser of evils. And then all we ever get is evil. Right? That's why we have to be a liberty-minded people. That means that we have to make the hard choices and do the difficult things. And we must, must be willing to say, I'm sorry, I can't vote for you. Because, number one, I don't know enough about you. Your party affiliation is not enough for me to vote for you. Because I happen to be a member of that cult of principles, and I believe that morality matters. You know, that argument, or that letter that um, Samuel Adams wrote to Dr. James Warren was in response to a House member who had betrayed the country with foreign enemies. Actually, with Great Britain, actually, prior to the War of 1812. And, you know, Samuel Adams was shocked at the fact that everybody was surprised this man had betrayed the states. And in this letter, he's simply saying, look, you all knew he cheated on his wife. Why is it a surprise to you that he would cheat on his country? Because morality matters. If you want to get down to the basics of it, it's not really an issue of infidelity as it is deception. It doesn't matter what deception you engage in, but if you are living a life of deception, then you can't be trusted in any realm. A man who can look his wife in the face and cheat on her, the one that she, he has dedicated his life to before God pledged there would be no other. If he can look her in the face and then break that bond, Samuel Adams is simply saying, why should it surprise you that he would betray his country? Because one deceptive betrayal is no different than the other. And his oath to his wife should be more compelling than any oath that he takes to the country. Be why? Because morality matters. And apparently the establishment Republicans don't want you to know that. Because it takes the hard choices. Liberty over security. Principle over party. And truth over your favorite personality. And rest assured, if you stand on those principles, people will call you names. And people oh, will not like it when you point out that their favorite politicians are making mistakes. 
But you see, isn't that what liberty is all about? Freedom plus morality. The understanding that you are free to do whatever you choose. But some things are wrong. Liberty over security, principle over party, and truth over your favorite personality. Liberty first principles are the only thing that are going to restore this republic. And get us away from the lesser of two evils. You know, I was researching for today's show uh, last few days, and uh, <laughs> I came across the perfect news story on Friday. An Uber driver with a concealed carry permit thwarted an attempted mass shooting by pulling his own weapon and shooting a gunman who had opened fire in Chicago's Logan Square. I mean, how can you fit so many perfect facts into one situation. This is liberty in the face of tyrannical government. An Uber driver carrying a concealed weapon stopped a mass shooting in Chicago. (laughs) And no one else was hurt besides the guy who tried to open fire. That is so awesome. Because as we are trying to deny people their liberty to engage in an employment without government regulation, Uber drivers are being outlawed across the country. Chicago hates guns. The entire city of Chicago is practically a gun-free zone. Which is why you have somebody trying to engage in a mass shooting in Chicago's Logan Square. Because they think they're safe. But ha ha ha, think again. Because somebody had a gun. And somebody stopped a mass shooting in Chicago. Man. That is beautiful. Liberty is awesome. Chris Ann Hall Show. She's Liberty's lobbyist. You know what else is interesting about this Uber driver stopping this mass shooting? So you have this guy in uh, Chicago's Logan Square who begins shooting in a crowd. And the Uber driver stops. His name is, uh, can I even say this? Everardo Custodio. By firing six, six shots at Custodio, wounding him in the shin, thigh, and lower back. No one else was injured, and Custodio was not executed. I just want you to recognize that This Uber driver stopped a mass shooter, not by executing him, by simply shooting him in the shin, the thigh, and the lower back. And how can this Uber driver, who is clearly not trained in the skills of law enforcement, how is he able to disarm this situation without someone ending up dead. I mean, I think that's something we need to think about as we see in our reports more and more in the news of law enforcement officers using extreme force 
to stop people from running away. There are other means of stopping people from running away. There are other means of stopping people. And this Uber driver apparently understood that. And what would have happened if this Uber driver had decided not to carry his gun that day? What would have happened if that Uber driver said, you know, they don't really like Uber drivers. I'm not going to be an Uber driver. And they don't really like guns in Chicago. As I drive through Chicago, I'm not going to carry my gun. How many people do you suppose would have, had, would have died waiting for 911 responders? This is why the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Because we can't wait around for people to show up. Because we have an inherent right to defend ourselves and defend others. The Illinois Assistant State Attorney Barry Quinn verified that he had a conceal and carry permit. And he will not be charged because he acted in the defense of himself and of others. Hey, carrying permit holders. Why aren't you carrying all the time? Oh, well, I don't need to carry all the time. Yeah, you don't need to carry all the time until you need to. And then you don't have it. And that's the biggest regret you will ever have. That you didn't when you needed. And that's why we are grateful that an Uber driver was able to defend the people of Chicago even though they hate guns. But now we're going to talk about something very important. Freedom of speech and the Fourth Amendment. And a parental right issue all wrapped up in one. We're going to thank Ben Swan for bringing this assault on the rights of the people to the public forefront. On March 21st, 24th, a woman by the name of Shauna Banda, her life was flipped upside down after her son was taken by, from her by the state of Kansas. Now all this started because of a discussion in this boy's classroom, a drug education class, and her son, who had previously lived in Colorado, disagreed with this drug education class. He disagreed with some of the anti-cannabis points that they were being made by the school officials. Why? Because cannabis oil had cured his mother's diseases. And some people wouldn't like that I was different It never really mattered how hard it would be Cause she filled me with love and the strength to leave She said, Chris Ann Hall Show. She's Liberty's lobbyist. So this 11-year-old in his government school is receiving a, gu- a drug education class. And he steps up and says, you know, I disagree with you on some of the things that you are saying about this cannabis. Because you see... My mom knows about this stuff. Cannabis oil cured her Crohn's disease, something they said she would never, ever be able to be cured from, and began to educate his class on the facts 
of cannabis and its health benefits. And after he spoke out about medical marijuana, he was detained and the police launched a raid on his mother's home. Why? Based on what? Based on an 11-year-old trying to educate his class on medical marijuana. They showed up at his mom's home without a warrant and asked to search. And she said, no, you're not coming into my home without a warrant. They refused to allow her in her own home without a warrant for three hours. For three hours with no legal authority. These Kansas officers refused to let her in her own home. And then when they finally got her warrant, the warrant, they refused to allow her to be present during that search and searched and raided her home. Now, here's what's going on in the meantime. Her son is in custody. They have detained him. He's 11 years old. And they are interrogating him without the presence of either parent. Now, these parents are separated. So there's absolutely no reason why they couldn't have called the father in, in this situation. He wasn't living in the home they were trying to raid without a warrant to be present while they interrogated this 11-year-old child. But based on this interrogation without parents' home, they obtained a warrant to search the house and to remove this child from the custody of his mother. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been involved in Child Protective Services issues, but they are absolutely tyrannical. You have a right to a trial by jury If they try to take your property, but if they seize your child, the courts do not respect your right to a trial by jury. The only trial you get is one before a judge and a CPS officer who, let me tell you what, has direct contact with that judge on a daily basis has an established relationship with that judge, has created, undoubtedly, a biased relationship with that judge, which means that judge is no longer impartial in any CPS hearing. And so you have a CPS officer and a judge who cannot be impartial and no jury judging whether your child shall be taken from you by the government. This is happening more and more. And now we have to wait weeks, days and weeks, and sometimes months to see custody restored to these parents because that's how this happens. This is not how it should happen. How is it that you have a greater due process right in your car than you do with your child? How is it that your child can be interrogated by government officials without having a parent present, but a child can't legally contract until he's 18 years old? A child can't illegally engage into a, in a contract until he's 18 year old because in the eyes of the law, someone under the age of 18 is not legally competent on their own. So how can the government take their testimony as being legally competent when they've been interrogated without a parent? I want you to see what's going on here. This is not about whether this woman had illegal drugs in her possession. I don't want to hear how the government has to take uh, custody of our children to keep them safe. 
There is absolutely no reason why the government in this situation, there was no evidence whatsoever. There was no evidence of violence. There was no evidence that this child's life was in danger. There was no evidence collected whatsoever. Just biased interrogation, coerced testimony. And that ought not be. Because you see, the Fourth Amendment is not just simply a limitation on the federal government. It is a declaration of our inherent rights. And the crazy thing is, the, the Fourth Amendment makes it clear that you're not free from all searches and seizures. You're just free from unreasonable ones. And then tells us what an unreasonable search and seizure is. A search and seizure that is unreasonable is one without a warrant. One that contains no probable cause. It's not supported by oath or affirmation, particularly describing the place to be searched or the persons or things to be seized. Well, Chrisanne, they finally got an, a, a warrant, but not after they seized her person for three hours without a warrant. They told her they seized her entire house for three hours without a warrant. You are not allowed to leave from our presence and you are not allowed to go in your house for three hours without a warrant. Do you know, that would not have happened in my presence. Because you see, you have to have a warrant to seize my things and my person. And you cannot legally stop me from entering my home. Why? Not because the Constitution says so, but because liberty says so. The Constitution does not grant you rights. The Constitution simply recognizes what already belongs to you. And we'd better wake up quickly. Because these inherent rights are being redefined out of existence. Not by our amendments. Not by our consent. But by government court expanding government power. And this is not acceptable in a place built on the principles that we must preserve the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. She tried to enter her home to get medication for her child who suffers from diabetes. And the officer said, no, you can't go in there. If he gets sick, we'll call EMS. How crazy is that? He tried to use the fact that her child was suffering from diabetes, a threat of a diabetic attack, as leverage to coerce her into waiving her right to refuse a search by suggesting that he could enter into the home to get the medication. But she could not. This is insane. We need to be willing to stand up against this kind of craziness because our Bill of Rights is not a limitation on the federal government. It is a recognition of what our inalienable rights ought to be. And you think... You think that no government can be tyrannical? You think that your city can't be tyrannical? You think that your state can't be tyrannical? Our framers, perhaps in their naivete, believe that we would never allow this happening on the local level. We, we have these things because our framers found them so offensive and because we have a, as a culture have redefined who people are in their jobs. We don't understand their proper application. Our local peacekeepers were never supposed to have the power to override our liberties. Because you see, they were all seen by our framers to be a power wielded by government. And in their day, when local law enforcement exceeded its power, they engaged in protests, mock hangings, 
and mock funeral processions of local people enforcing tyrannical laws. I'm not suggesting that we do that. I'm suggesting we stand for liberty. No matter what government is acting in a tyrannical manner, no matter which government is attempting to steal our inalienable rights. No government should be allowed to be unreasonable in their searches and seizures. How does that make any sense whatsoever? And if we don't start taking a stand in these situations, what will our children be taught? How will our children be able to understand the value of liberty and the necessity of the adults to protect it. And when they become an adult, what does that mean? And how is it that we can stand around and allow our children to be interrogated by the government and allow that to be acceptable? To allow that testimony to be acceptable is legally outrageous. Those, the judge who issued the warrant based on that testimony ought to be disbarred. Why? Are we allowing this to happen? Well, because, you know, the end justified that means, right? What kind of society are we living in when that's okay? This should not be acceptable, America, in a place that believes liberty right is our right. Don't censor my voice. Hate me if you won't, or love me if you can. If the truth is what you want, then you found your man. I ain't backing down, I ain't backing up. If you think like I think, then crack it on up. I won't back up, I don't back down. I've been raised up to stand my ground. Take my job, but not my Chris Ann Hall Show. She's Liberty's lobbyist. Many of you know that I was a Russian linguist in the military. And as I was a Russian linguist in the army, we not only learned to speak, read, and write the Russian language, we became fluent in the Russian culture as well. And I want to tell you what something very, very important. Do you see, when the government is allowed to interrogate your children without your presence, that is a communist tool. That's what communism does. It turns family against family and manipulates children into their indoctrinations. You see, the Russian culture has a hero, or at least they did during the communist reign. There are many people who are now understanding that this hero was just an invention of the communist government. His name is Pavel Morozov. Pavlik is what the Russians called them public as a diminutive of Pavel. And they called him Pavlik Morozov. Pavlik Morozov was anywhere from an 11 year old to a 15 year old boy, given which source you're looking at. Because remember, this is a completely invented story. There was a boy named Pavel, but not in the way that the communists reinvented this boy. You see, the story goes that in 1932, Pavlik exposed his father as an enemy of the people. He informed the OGPU, which is the KGB of that time, that his father was helping the rebels. They were called kulaks. They were peasants who refused to relinquish their land and their livestock to the communist government, as was required by their collectivization plan. And so Pavlik turned in his father as a member of this rebel group and was, uh, had his father branded as an enemy of socialism. 
Pavlik's father was arrested, tried, and sent to a concentration camp, never to be seen again. Pavlik, the story goes, was then murdered by these rebels, and then after his death was hailed as a hero of the people. And every child in the Soviet Union was required to learn Pavlik's story and be prepared to follow his example. See something. Say something even if it means to turn in your parents. Because you see, this is a communist tool to get the people in line with the communist plan. Interrogate your children into the right beliefs and the right testimonies to turn in their parents for not going along with the government ideology. There were pictures of Pavlik in every school. The kids were taught to worship Pavlik, and Pavlik is coming to America. The CPS will make sure that happens. The governments will make sure that happens. Our children are being confiscated as property of the government, and you wonder why. See something, say something. Because Pavlik is coming here. If we don't stand and assert our parental rights over government authority... Pavlik is coming here, and we had better start protecting our children more than we're protecting our flat screen TVs and our cell phones and our computers and our cars and our homes. We need to be protecting our children more than our comforts because our children are being confiscated by the government without warrants, without due process. Our government is kidnapping our children. And we're supposed to be okay with that. Why? Because government knows best? Because government has a necessity to keep our children safe from our parents? Bad facts make bad law. And they make very, very bad justifications. We cannot allow the government to infringe upon our right to have custody of our children without due process. And we cannot allow safety to override that in a general sense. Because then government owns our children and we do not. It's time to get educated and stand for liberty. God bless. See you tomorrow.